Thank you. For I have a, a difficult decision to make. I can either feed you or I can feed my notes. So I'm now going to take my glasses off and I can read my notes. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about an exhibition that I'm curating for the BNA, which opens next April 2018, and it'll run for 10 months until the end of January 2019. Now, we haven't done our full, or our full press release for the exhibition, so I'm under orders not to reveal too much. Um, so I hope this is actually going to frustrate you and you'll all want to come to London next year. Fashion from Nature explores the complex relationship between fashion and nature from 1600 to the present day. Fashion is, quite literally, fashioned, made from materials found in nature. Its design is often inspired by the world around us, and it depends on our planet for, its raw materi for the raw materials of its creation and the energy and natural resources required throughout a garment's life cycle. These demands and processes have damaged and continue to damage the earth and its flora and fauna, particularly today in a world of fast fashion, rising consumption and global production. And as my first slide suggests, we are looking very holistically at fashion. We're making absolutely no distinction whatsoever between um, materials made from the so-called natural fibres and materials made from man-made fibres, which is why I've included this wonderful Poiré dress on the screen. We've had scientific analysis done on it, and it was either made from cupromonium, cupro, or from visco. Their scientific profiles are very similar. The exhibition will certainly be the first British exhibition to examine the environmental impact of fashion over a long historical period. It asks two questions. How can we define a more sustainable future for fashion? And can we learn anything from the past? The exhibition's narrative was prompted by today's widespread concerns about the harm caused by the fashion industry and also by the V&A's collection of fashion and textiles. Many objects, which were originally acquired because they exemplified particular materials and techniques, stimulate new questions when viewed through, through the lens of today's environmental preoccupations. But way back uh, when I first started thinking about doing this exhibition, I was particularly intrigued by the V&A's animal product collection. Only about 800 items from this once very large collection survive today, but the majority of those fall into the category of textiles and fashion. Now, on the screen, on the top right, we have some swatches of 19th century British silks manufactured in Macclesfield. And on the bottom right, a rather kitsch um, but sweet spray of flowers made from painted shells imported from the Bahamas. On the top le left, earrings made from the heads of the red-legged honey creeper from the tropical New World. This bird was particularly important it particularly um, liked for its incredibly vibrant blue feathers and was, um, and was imported in astonishing quantities to meet the demand of the plumage trade. And uh, on the bottom left, a very large uh, mother of pearl button, which is made from a species of mollusk which is now protected. The collection, which, which originated from exhibits at the Great Exhibition of 1851, was overtly educational and focused on the economic purposes to which animals and animal parts could be put. As Melissa said, this grew out of the creed that um, God had made the earth um, for man's use and profit. Echoing the spirit of the exhibition, it encompassed an astonishingly diverse range of materials from around the globe, chosen to show the production, industrial resources, manufacturers and commerce of all countries. From raw material, to finished product, and the displays were arranged like that um, in sequence, starting with raw materials. Um, it, ac its acquisition was, drawn by the museum, was driven by the muse uh, museum's early focus on developing scientific reference collections, which could potentially provide examples for Britain's manufacturing and mercantile classes and encourage innovation. In the mid-19th century, some 93% of British imports were unprocessed raw materials from the British Empire and elsewhere, and about the same percentage of exports were manufactured goods. Taking the lead from the collection, but inverting the life cycle process, fashion from nature uses finished garments and accessories as vehicles to look more closely at their raw materials. 
the exhibition text explores the qualities of these materials, the values they had for people at the time, and the impact of their manufacture, use, and disposal on the natural world. The range of materials used in fashion has increased substantially since 1600, and so not all materials are covered in every section of the exhibition, but cotton remains a constant. In each period, the composition of the v collection, the prevalence of similar cu uh, clusters in other British collections, and the descriptions of fashionable dress found in writing of the time inform informed our choice of garment. So the exhibition is arranged chronologically. Uh, the first section covers 200 years from 1600 to 1800, during, which the, the, during the course of which the principal inventions that paved the way for the mechanization of the textile industry in the 19th century were conceived. It was a period when clothing and textiles were made by hand, and during which raw materials and man-made products from Asia, Africa, and, and the Americas reached Europe in increasing quantities of international trading routes spread. By the end of the pe period, more people than ever before in Europe could afford small fashionable luxuries. But already, even in 1600, the European beaver had become scarce due, due to overhunting, leading, leading uh, whaling ships and, uh, uh, sorry, leading uh, a search in, no in the north of no North America uh, for new supplies of the fur. In the 18th century, philosophical, moral, and religious uh, questions were raised about the human treatment not only of domestic animals, but also of wide, wild animals by thinkers such as um, Jeremy Bentham and uh, John Wesley. And in centres of industrial production, particularly London, which was a huge hub of, of industrial pro production at the time, um, air, water, and waste pollution affected great swathes of the population and affected the ecosystems of rivers. The second section, uh, if I should say that the section is represented on the slide um, by a lovely lace-trimmed linen collar, which um, is in the, in the case looking at flax. The second section, 1800 to 1900, shows our development from the ready-to-wear industry, whose expansion was underpinned by the mechanization, by mechanization and the ready supply of raw materials increased the scale of the fashion industry, enabling it to meet the needs of a rising population with disposable income to spend on fashion. Other innovative technologies, such as the development of chemical dyes, and on the screen there's a wonderful um, flask um, of Movine, which we borrowed from the Fans Museum, uh, the earliest, um, well, not the earliest synthetic dye, but Perkins' famous uh, synthetic dye. Um, so the so the development of chemical dyes um, and the experiment with materials like spun glass reduced prices and supported the growing interest in creating man-made materials, particular substitutes for silk, which were subject to fluctuations in supply because of the prevalence of disease among silkworms. The displays also draw attention to the fashion for furs and feather trimmings, which we've heard quite a, a lot about from Melissa, and the campaigns they provoked. The increasing industrialization brought air, water, and waste pollution to new areas of Britain, particularly the industrial Midlands and North and the west, west of um, Scotland. And some centres, such as Manchester, became notorious. The, uh, the term acid rain uh, was coined about the environment in Manchester and in London uh, during the 1850s. But for the first time, national legislation was introduced uh, in an attempt to combat air and water pollution, uh, but it had varying degrees of success due to the problems of implementing these, um, uh, these laws. Our third period begins in 1900 with the commercial development of viscose, which was a particularly polluting industry with severe occupational hazards for those who worked in it. However, the man-made fibre industry revolutionised textiles introducing an ever-expanding range of fibres of varying t qualities, textures and attributes that complement and are often combined with the traditional fibres derived from plant and animal sources. This section ends in 2000 when the fashion industry was becoming increasingly global in its scale. The final exhibits in this display highlight the seeds of awareness in the industry of its impact 
and the leadership of diviners like Helen Storey and Catherine Hamlet, who campaigned to raise awareness of the social and environmental impact of the fashion industry, while offering clothes made from more ethically forced and manufactured textiles. Oil became a big issue in the 20th century, and on the screen we've got a great, P great uh, PBC shift uh, defined by Stephen Willett. But on the plus side, uh, the Washington Convention of 1975, signed by 80 nations, uh, accords varying degrees of protection to over, to over 35,000 species. The final display, which is a very large one, um, is about the 21st century. It includes garments and accessories which use a variety of strategies to reduce their impact on the environment and its flora, fauna, fauna and human communities. Alongside two interactive installations developed by students and staff at the Centre for Sustainable Fashion at London College of Fashion. And the jacket on the screen um, is, was designed by Bruno Peters as part of his Honest by label, which uses the details of the history of the garment uh, to inform the design of the textile. It's a very striking piece. Now, the 20th century display and the 21st century display are bridged by a, an open um, section, open display called Protest, and it's represented here by the T-shirt from Cap Catherine Hamlet's fam famous Clean Up or Die collection. And I'll be coming back to the sections on protest in, 20, in the 21st century later on. So we have more monkeys. So Chris has already very eloquently told you about um, the trope of the monkey in European culture. Um, so I won't go into that again. Um, but the human relationship with nature forms a very important thread in the exhibition's narrative. And each period inclu includes a case which focuses, focuses on this. Aspects of this relationship can be seen in many garments in the museum's collection whose materials, decoration or construction are inspired by nature or image of it. Although these garments were often originally collected to demonstrate the use of pattern forces, uh, of use of divine forces and pattern making, they reflect the interest, delight and solace that humans find in nature, particularly in the, and particularly in the 18th and 19th centuries, the growing professionalisation of natural history and the introduction of species new to Europe. Research into this rather wonderful waistcoat embroidered with, mo with monkeys revealed several ways in which humans interacted with nature in the late 18th century. The embroidery design survives in the archives of the Musée des Tissus in Lyon, and Paula Jenkins, curator of mammals at the Natural History Museum in London, identified the monkeys in their source. The monkey, the monkey offering his companion a fruit if a crab-eating macaque, and the other if a lion-tailed macaque. Both are derived from Georges-Louis Leclerc, Comte de Buffon's um, multi-volume natural history, which was published between 1749 and 1888, and the first volume, early volumes were dedicated to Louis XV. Monkeys were fashionable pets and could be observed at the Jardin du Roi, now the Jardin du Plante, where Buffon was director, and at the Menagerie at the Tower of London. Choosing monkeys from Buffon's publication, which was translated into many European languages to create an embroidery pattern for a waistcoat, reflected the success of Buffon's masterpiece among Europe's wealthy, educated classes and the social kudos that the King's patronage brought Buffon and the study of natural history. In turn, its wearer demonstrated his learning and his aware awareness of the interest in natural history at the highest level of society, where its author was fated and lionized. The monkey's depiction also has more negative connotations. Monkeys were captured to be bought and sold as pets or specimens, and forced to live in, in unnatural and undoubtedly distressing environments for human am amusement as well as the advancement of knowledge. Now, one of the challenges of the exhibition is keeping nature to the fore. It is essentially a fashion exhibition, but we need to remind people the whole time that fashion is derived from nature and of, and of why we, why we are love nature, why we are in such awe and wonder at the natural world around us. Um, and so we are doing this um, partly through showing the raw material from which garments are made alongside them. We're also doing it through the use of photographs 
and videos of living animals in their natural habitats and through a sound. We've commissioned a soundscape uh, in order to do this for the exhibition. So um, on the screen, on the top right, you have my favourite, who is a stoat in its winter coat, um, which provided ermine fur, and it's a taxidermy by the famous Victorian taxidermist Roland Ward, and has been lent by a private collector. And on the top left, um, cotton balls, showing the lint around the seeds. Bottom right, chips of wood, which I rather hope the Poiré mannequin might hold in her hand, um, because, of course, viscose is made from wood pulp. And on the bottom left, um, a collection of over 30 hummingbirds, just of one species. It's a terrible photograph, I apologise. Um, these belong to the same private collector and, a, and were in a, um, a very dark room in a dark drawer. Um, but we wanted to use this, this quantity of birds to try and suggest the, the magnitude of the plumage trade. Where we can, we're also taking this approach in the cases which explore how fashion has been inspired by nature. The bird fake print used by Giles Deacon for his autumn winter 2016 collection was created from plates in Arthur, in Arthur Butler's The Bird's, Egg, Bird's Eggs of the British Isles, which was published in 1904. Plate 12 illustrates guillemot's eggs, and we're going to be exhibiting a small group of guillemot's eggs around the dress. Now, very unfortunately, we couldn't achieve this through Butler's collection, uh, which has partially survived. We did try to do this. But I love the conceit of this print and the way the eggs defy gravity, hanging suspended in space. And, of course, eggs are very scientifically interesting in terms of the variations of their, of their um, patterning. Um, a series of case studies um, also enables us to shine a stronger light on the fashion industry and enable different aspects of it and the way in which it, uh, it forces natural materials, for instance. The first, which considers an 18th century mantua, which is made from a wonderful um, 18th century, wonderful Lyon silk, which incorporates a pattern of uh, ermine tails and flowers, highlights the global trade in raw materials and luxury goods. Its interpretation includes infographics and a map, as well as text. Another case study looks at new ways of retailing in the 19th century, contrasting a dressmaker-made outfit with a hat worn with it, which was purchased from a department store. Now, one of my principal challenges in the exhibition is conveying the escalating scale of the fashion industry um, and, and in an exhibition environment which must necessarily be pristine, the pollution and grime to which the textile industry contributed. In a case on fashionable goods in the 19th century, we're using multiple garments and accessories of the same type to suggest the scale of the ready-made ready industry. An image of Tennant's chemical works in Glasgow, which made bleaching powder and alkali substances, has been chosen to evoke pollution. The very tall chimney stacks were designed to reduce the impact on the immediate locality of the hydrogen chloride fumes emitted during the manufacture of these substances, which was converted in the atmosphere into hydrochloric acid. The acid damaged vegetation, harmed livestock, and created a noxious smell, uh, which the local communities complained vigorously about. And the image of the sharecroppers is a reminder of the human cost of the industry, although this is outside the, the main scope of the exhibition. Similarly, in a display that covers the 20th century, we're including a photograph of a seabird coated in oil on the label of a courage dress made from nylon, uh, which, after, which uh, as you know, also, which, as you know, derives from oil. The dependence on oil as a raw material for textiles and plastics and for energy, including for shipping, and its transportation around the world led to a corresponding rise in oil pollution in the sea and on beaches from oil-fired ships and oil tankers in the second half of the century. In 1952, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds and the British branch of the International Committee for Bird Preservation calculated that between 50,000 and 250,000 seabirds were harmed by oil pollution in the winter of 1951 to 2. Most died from starvation, cold, oil poisoning, or unable to fly were battered to death by waves. Disasters like the grounding of the Torrey Canyon tanker 
off the coast of Cornwall in 1957, the year that the Corish dress was, um, was shown to the public, led to around 36,000 tonnes of raw oil being in, released into the sea, and it had a significant impact on marine, marine life and birds. And we're also, of course, um, updating this in the 21st century section, uh, thinking about um, all the plastics that we uh, are so aware of now in the ocean today. Another challenge uh, was, was to convey the strength of feeling, energy, and, and amazing imagination behind the campaign of to raise public awareness of the damage to the planet caused by human activity. Um, our solution is an open display that brings together posters, placards, stickers, T-shirts, dress figures, and video to create a semblance of a demonstration. Not an easy thing to do in a V&A fashion gallery, but we're doing our best. Um, so the posters include uh, this really striking poster by Alexander Calder from 1971. It was one of a portfolio project of six posters um, by a leading modern artist funded by Olivetti. Um, and in the middle, we have a crown um, made by staff at Vivian Westwood from found objects to promote green energy, particularly the British firm Ecotricity. Um, on the left, um, we have Suvi Lau uh, wearing a jacket made for her by the London designer Katie Jones uh, from upcycled materials and handwork crochet. And if you look on the web, you can see a great film of Suvi trying, uh, trying to learn crochet um, from Katie Jones. And on the bottom, a Fashion Revolution poster uh, promoting their, um, their ongoing campaign, Who Made My Clothes? Two thirds of the Upper Exhibition Gallery are donated to the final section, which is called Designing for the 21st Century. The Lyocell, or Tencel trousers, created by Helen Story in 1993 seen on the screen, which are displayed in the 20th century, lead into this, 20th century display lead into this story. Tenfold is a cellulosic fibre made from plantation-grown sustainable softwood, which is processed in an environmentally friendly organic, sol organic solvent spinning process designed to recover over 99% of the solvent. Helen Story worked with Courtauld, the British uh, textile company, to develop the fibre and to make the first commercial examples of its use in 1993. And these groundbreaking pieces form an important part of the Vino's collection. And we're very much hoping that this exhibition will really enable us to build on our collection and when we are acquiring garments in the future to look at ways in which they measure up to our, our, our goals for a sustainable in industry. The 21st century displays prevent visitors with a range of contemporary approaches to reducing fashion's use of the world's natural resources, conserving its biodiversity and protecting its ecosystems. They include the use of pre- and post-consumer waste, the utilisation of waste from the food and drinks in industry to make textiles, and on the screen we have an out, uh, a detail of an outfit donated by Ferragamo, uh, which is made from orange fibre and silk, and the orange fibre is made from um, waste products for the citrus in industry in, in Italy. We also have reduced water denim, examples of clothes manufactured with green energy and from recycled textiles, garments that come with a documented supply chain, like um, Bruno Peters by Honest Trouser Suit, bioengineered textiles and dyes, and homemade pieces. Um, together, they offer low-tech and high-tech solutions with the latter demonstrating the exciting interdisciplinary research being developed today to reduce fas fashion of use of nature resources and improve its processes. And I should say that the sweater in the middle um, which was very kindly customised for us by Lou Stoppard, editor of Show Studio, and hence the initials on its front. Many, many people have contributed to the development of this exhibition but I'd particularly like to acknowledge the interest, support and expertise of colleagues at the Natural History Museum in London, who have made me welcome, provided identifications and guided my research. Mark Nesbitt, an ethnobotanist and curator of the Museum of Economic Botany at Kew, has also been extremely generous with his time and shared his knowledge and extraordinary collection with, with us. 
Similarly, Sue Mossman, the expert on plastics at the London Fans Museum, uh, with whom I've spent two afternoons looking at some incredibly early examples of the manufacture of viscose. We've also learned a huge amount from colleagues at the Centre of, of Sustainable at the Centre for Sustainable Fashion at the London College of Fashion. And I'm delighted to say that Professor Dillis Williams, who is the head of the centre, is contributing a chapter to the book. And uh, her students and also her fellow staff members are um, creating two installations for the exhibition. I'm also very grateful uh, to the staff at Chelsea College, the TED team, Textiles, Environment, Design, who mercilessly uh, but very pro positively critiqued my ideas and approaches. It was they who said, where's the grime? Um, uh, but they also enabled me to attend events where I met some of the exciting innovators who are participating in the exhibition. But during the development of Fashion from Nature, Turnip Rock in Lake Huron became something of a symbol for for symbol for the exhibition team of our intentions for the show. It bears an uncanny resemblance to a ship voyaging into new territories. And for me, this has been a journey into new territories. I have learned an enormous amount, both about um, textiles, textile manufacturing in the past, and um, about now and the, where we hope to go in the future. The, island, the, the rock is also battered, weather-beaten, beautiful, but the resilience of nature have led to new growth, and this is what we hope this exhibition will do. We want our visitors to enjoy seeing the garments and accessories in the exhibition, be impressed by their quality, craftsmanship, creativity, but we also hope that the exhibition will make them more aware of the ecological and environmental cost of fashion. We'd like them to leave the exhibition feeling curious about what their own clothes are made of, how they are made, where they are made, maybe valuing them that little bit more to make them keep them a little bit longer, and understanding the benefits to society and to nature of changing the way if we make, use, and dispose of our clothes. Now, this makes the challenges we face sound straightforward and easily soluble. They are not. And probably my greatest challenge as a curator is to, if to uh, write a clear but nuanced narrative that provides our visitors with the information they need to make, an, to make more informed choices. I also hope they will be, be inspired and impressed by the ways in which science, design, and importantly business, are coming together to meet the challenge to create a more responsible industry, which continues to create exciting, novel, and desirable clothes. Thank you. <laughs>